President of the Court of Appeal is made by President Muhammad Ali, subject to confirmation of the Senate. The President's approval of the appointment of Justice Mensim followed the recommendation of the Chief Justice of Nigeria in line with provision of Section 238, Subsection 4 and 5 of the 1999 Constitution as amended. Now, the retiring president of the Court of Appeal, Justice Zaina Bukachua, has called for greater attention to be paid across the country to educate and empowerment and empowerment of the girl child and women generally. She made the call at the special valedictory court session held to mark our exit as president of the Court of Appeal. I go away with good cheers and I pray that the Almighty Allah answers our prayers and grant us the will to build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. Honorable Justice Zainab Kachua has remained one of the best legal luminaries that this nation can boast of in our present day and legal chronicle. Vice President Yemi Oshimbaje has called on state, local government and the business community as well as civil society organizations to collaborate in support of the MSMEs. These are just a few of the initiatives to ensure an empowering and inclusive business environment for our small businesses. We as federal government will do our part. But I believe that it's important that we emphasize that we must all work together, both the federal, state governments, local governments, as well as uh, the civil society groups, the business groups, you know, the chambers of commerce. All of us have uh, a, a, a bounding duty to ensure that we work together. And the Senate has approved $22.79 billion as 2016-2018 federal government external borrowing plan. Three states of Kaduna, Kastina and Kogi are to also benefit from the fund. There is no economy anywhere in the world, anywhere, even developed economies, where debts are not used for growth. But let me also emphasize here that we are going to follow very strictly how these funds are applied by the executive arm of government funding the projects. And the House of Representatives has passed a resolution to investigate the Central Bank of Nigeria and other entities over alleged $30 billion revenue leakage on foreign exchange transactions. We have huge revenue challenges to the extent that our budgets are not executed to the latter. We have to block all leakages possible. There are two types of leakages. There's the negligence-based leakages, but there's also leakages based on acts of, uh, deliberate acts of fraud, which is obviously more egregious. And these are the areas that I believe that uh, your committee and banking will be looking into. A Nigerian who recently returned from France and displayed some symptoms similar to that of coronavirus has been quarantined at the mainland hospital Yaba, Lagos State. Lagos State Commissioner of Health, Professor Aki Abayomi, disclosed this during the daily update on the virus. Returned three days ago, developed headache, but no fever, just headache and some respiratory symptoms. We're not taking chances. There's active transmission going on in France, and so we've isolated it. We're running the test, and we will have that information as soon as it's ready. And that's the morning news. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Kirian and Claire in just a break. Um, the program is Good Morning Nigeria. Now let's go business. Reviving the ailing business of uh, Rafia Palm and Babu uh, Valley Chain in focus on uh, our business news with uh, Chimobi Water Energy.
Rough your palm or rattan and the bamboo value chain is a business that is worth trillions of dollars outside the country but Nigeria though blessed with the enormous resources is yet to tap into this growing global business. The Director General International Bamboo and Rattan Organization Alin Chumo noted that the business in Nigeria needs a bottom-top approach in reviving the potentials of the business so as to add it to the country's multi-million dollar revenues PINA annually. The organization, which Nigeria is among the six member countries in Africa, noted that Nigeria has great potentials in taking over the international market with its indigenous designs. With the government, how we can increase uh, the involvement of the government in developing this, this sector and to raise the awareness uh, of the uh, of the officials, of the business community and of the local people to see that there's a lot of benefit that can be derived from bamboo and I'm sure... This place we are now is not profilable and the reason why it's not profilable is because it's a green area. So over time we've really been calling on government to provide an enabling environment for us in areas provide lands and possible demonstration center. Meanwhile, the Chairman House Committee on Poverty Alleviation, Abdullahi Salami, while commending the performance of the Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency, Sweden, on its effort in creating capacity for small and medium enterprises, noted that the agency is positioned to grow Nigeria's SME sector through regular engagement, training and giving of grants where necessary. Also, and we have discussed, we have been directed, directed with the uh, AG and the uh, heads of various departments. And now we agree that uh, we are going to work together for us to achieve the work that we are headed to achieve. And they are also able to see and then to act uh, in the performance of the 2019 budget and then what we are supposed to do in 2020 and ensure that the agency has implemented the budget as it was uh, approved uh, by Mr. President. And now to the stock market where trading has sustained the upward trajectory for the week, inching up by 0.04% at the close of trading Thursday. Here is a graphic representation of closing figures on the floor of the exchange. With business news, I'm Chimubi Walter Naji. Right, many thanks, Chimobi Water and Nigel, for the business package. And time to check trending headline news, and that's coming up in newspaper review right now. Our newspaper reviewer, Bayo Terbi, is already here in the studio. Bayo, good morning and good morning, welcome. Claire. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Claire. Yeah. Good morning, Nigeria. Okay. We're reviewing uh, about three newspapers this morning. And uh, uh, let's begin with uh, uh, leadership newspaper. Leadership newspaper. Uh, let's go from top to bottom. Federal government to execute 44 root projects within uh, 150 billion or uh, with. 150 billion naira, as on page 12. Federal government to execute 44 root projects with 150 billion naira. Governors, minister behind my ordeal, Shomole alleges, as on page 2. Federal government uncovers 70,000 goods workers. You find details of that on page 10. Now, the lead headline on leadership newspaper this morning. PMB appoints Domban Menson, acting appeal court president, with two riders as Justice Bukachua bows out. MBA calls for appointment of more appellate court justices. Uh, details on page four. Now, coronavirus, that's the kicker. ACF postpones 20th anniversary celebration. Virus uh, forced me to adjust my birthday plan, uh, says Obasanjo. Uh, the story uh, is on page four. Now, telecoms to invest $1 trillion on 5G networks. 
Page 13 is where you get details of that report. Now, federal government to begin registration of livestock. It's on page 13. Now, PMB will complete legacy projects in Southeast, says the presidency. It's on um, page 11 of uh, the election newspaper for this Friday. Okay, let's turn our attention to the nation. Quite a busy front page it has, but let's uh, begin with the lead story. And uh, there are two leads there, uh, but the one very boldly written and captioned it's, uh, and of course, uh, they, um, they are after me because of 2023, says Oshomole. And it comes with uh, uh, two riders there. Federal High Court maintains status quo. Party chair goes to appeal court and fire me, Buhari, meet at Villa. Uh, those are the riders that follow uh, that lead story. And just uh, above it, you find the story on COVID and, uh, of course, uh, what it's doing to economies. COVID-19 threatens Lagos Ibadan, real completion deadline. And it has the rider Nigerian in isolation and return from France. Uh, this would make for interesting reading uh, because you see the picture of uh, the Minister of Transportation right there. Uh, so the story continues on page eight. And just beside that, uh, you can see, of course, uh, what uh, uh, COVID-19 is also doing, the impacts there. Angola bars Nigerian travelers. You can find that story on the inside. Uh, NCAA issues form filling order. And uh, former President Obasanjo says, it changed my plans. And this is uh, the big one. IMF gives $50 billion to battle virus. You can read up the stories on the inside pages 5, 7, and 39. Then let me take you just above the nameplate. Government goes tough with ASU over payroll. Details of that on page 41. No enrollment, no pay. Well, I don't know who is saying that, but we have the picture of the finance minister, uh, of course, emboldened there. Uh, you may want to pick up that and check who is saying that. But Boko Haram kills six policemen in Dapture attack. Uh, read it up on page six. Emir Sanusi, six new date to honor probe invitation. Okay, let's quickly take a look at some other trending stories just uh, uh, by the column, my right column that will be to your left. INEC targets e-voting from next polls. INEC targets e-voting from next polls. South East, South, South to get security outfits. And you see the picture of the APC uh, national chairman in a warm handshake, I want to say, with the president, uh, President Bu Mohamed Buhari at the villa. And that happened yesterday, of course, with the quotes right there. Bio. Yeah, for let's you? start with uh, the update on coronavirus. Okay. Uh, so far, Nigeria has one confirmed case. However, three other suspected cases have been identified. One uh, arrived from France, the second arrived from England, and the third arrived from China. The Commissioner for Health, uh, Lagos State Professor Akin Abayomi, says the three are in isolation, uh, are the pending test of their status. They are, the three are, are in a place called the Holding Bay, after their test come out, if the test positive, then they will be moved into isolation and treatment will commence. However, if the test returns negative, they will be allowed to go home. And uh, no, no quarantine for them? No 14 for day now, or self isolation? For, for now, they are in isolation and they will continue to be in isolation until the test, if the test comes out and it is negative how long will that that, that should be uh, that shouldn't take long uh, because we have a very reliable test center in lagos another in irua and uh, another one in, in abuja that won't take long however it, it is the emphasis is to show that there is only one confirmed case the importer from milan yeah. who is uh, said to be improving gradually although some reports indicate that uh, he has gone into depression i don't i'm not too sure uh, that has not been confirmed well, we by have the not, commission. We have not, yes, yes, the commission to Lagos State has not confirmed that. So far, mm. the three cases are only suspected cases. They are subject to investigation. If they test positive, they will be moved into isolation for treatment. If they test negative, 
they will be le le left off the hook and they will go home. Is that as a result of the temperature, you know, the high temperature being detected? Because I, on, on the foreign media this morning, we hear that, you know, as, as, as soon as, you know, your temperature reads higher than 38 and all that, you're not even allowed entry. Yes. In some places, yes, above the normal, mm. you are a suspect. You recall that Pope Francis had a cold and there was suspicion that probably it could be coronavirus because uh, he was out in the audience uh, in Italy where there's a high rate of uh, some infection and they, they, there was anxiety. However, when the test came, it showed that he was negative to you coronavirus. Know, there so, are many other flus, you know, yeah. around. Normal cough we have, uh, normal sneezing and normal, uh, you know, uh, attack on the resp uh, upper respiratory organ that we have. Uh, the idea about, uh, uh, you know, uh, anybody who tests uh, with a high temperature to be quarantined is very apt, you know, at this point because of the way the virus is, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is infecting people, you know. So the, the, the most important thing that they've been able to do is to put those three people in check. By the time result comes out, they're free to go. Because one, if they had anything corona in, in them and result, you know, reads it negative, there's no point keeping them there. Mm. In, in the I didn't have time to go uh, to the inside pitch to find out why Angola is buying Nigerian travelers. Again, it's part of the false alarm. Because they know that there's a reported case of an incident in Nigeria. And so they were trying to place if anybody coming from Nigeria uh, put him in, in check or maybe stop them from coming yes, at so all. You, you know, Bayo, again, we must be careful how we treat this issue so that we don't descend into racism, you know, racism. Because by the time you begin to profile people, you know, and all that, I mean... I think uh, they are trying to be careful and, yes. and they are raising an unnecessary alarm. It's not everybody that is in Nigeria that is infected with coronavirus. Exactly. <laughs> so far, we have one and it came from Milan. And not every Chinese is also infected with uh, COVID-19. But the consequence is already telling on us. You recall that the Lagos Ibadan Railway was meant to have been commissioned in April by Mr. President. Yes. Now, most of the workers uh, belonging to the Chinese Construction Company mm -hmm. Corporation who had gone home for the Chinese New Year are stuck in China. Yes. So they are not back and therefore the, the rail project is, is, is kept on hold. Yes, they were the expected to have completed that in April and continue the one from Lagos to Kano mm. uh, on the standard gauge. But you know, all that will have you know, to be on hold. The, the, the spread of coronavirus is is becoming is getting to a pandemic point, you know, because in Italy, for instance, schools have been closed. Yes. Gatherings schools, have been closed all in, in the next one month, mm. right? And if, uh, of course, uh, in, in in even football uh, football uh, uh, you know encounters, like some of them have been have, been have been moved. Have been, have, been, have, been, have, been, have been playing uh, behind closed doors, if, if you like, you know. So it's really, it's, I don't blame any country really that is taking going extra mile to take precautionary measures because if it comes in, it has come, and if it gets there, if it gets one person and care is not taken, many more are going to get it, especially family units. Right. If someone who has it now comes home, meets his family members, children, wife and, and all that, cousins or nephews as kids maybe, it is moving. So, so it has to be stopped. I don't blame Angola. Yes, you, 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 you know, and, and, and the, the frightening aspect of it, of course, Bayo and, and Kieran, is the, is the impact it's having on economies. And I hear in some parts of the world where it's, it's going now that people are now working from home. You know, schools, like he said, schools are short. You can imagine uh, the Minister Amici is saying, of course, that, um, you know, he's afraid that uh, the Lagos Ibadan Rail Project would be delayed, you know, of course, beyond the scheduled completion time as a result of that. In fact, he said many workers handling the Lagos Ibadan Rail Project are stuck in China mm -hmm. because of the COVID-19. Yeah. yeah. You know, so... Well, the, the, the other story that is dominating mm. the papers, too, is the... The order from a federal high court in mm. Kano mm. restraining the Independent National Ele Electoral Commission from recognizing anybody other than Comrade Adams Oshiomole as the national chairman of the All Progressive Congress. This is sequel to an order uh, ex parte that was filed in Kano. Now, Comrade Adams Oshiomole is saying that the interlocutory injunction filed by at an FCT high court restraining INEC, Inspector General of Police, and the DG DSS was an order given to federal agencies and an FCT high court has no business giving such order. It should have been a federal high court that should give such orders. But the order from the Kanu federal high court is directed at the Esako local government that initially suspended Comrade Adams Therefore, ordering them to maintain the status quo. 
Lawyers at the are, world level. Yes, at the world level. Mm -hmm. To maintain status quo at the world level. Their action was that they have suspended him as a member of the party. And, and based on that, they were speculating that he cannot continue to be chairman. Mm -hmm. So the status quo ante is required that they should not do anything about removing him at the world level until the, the ex-party motion is determined. But lawyers are confusing us. Yes. They are arguing that the last status quo ante was the order of, of the, the, the court of, of the of the FCT FCT court. court in Jabi. It, it, it. And they are saying that that court has no business giving an order to federal agencies. It ought to have come to from the federal high court. Well, mm. you know, lawyers, for every issue, lawyers will tell you there are two sides of an issue and they will always argue. Let's wait. The court will sort things out. My okay. worry about uh, such uh, you know, litigations is the fact that uh, some of us who are not uh, uh, learned gentlemen and, you know, uh, and ladies may, you know, uh, not be properly carried along, you know, because from the all indications, uh, Adam Shemala is currently embattled. And if I, if I were him, the best thing to do is to talk to your people. He says, governors, minister behind my ordeal. You know, so it's not just a world issue. He has gone beyond the world uh, to extend to governors uh, of the same party, you know, where you are chair. So it's important that, you know, he goes back home, does his homework, you know, make national contact and try to, you know, reconcile the situation. Well, yesterday he had actually gone to brief the president after the court in Kano gave his order. And he speculated that a, a, a minister and some governors are after him. And he says that nobody can remove him except God. Uh, it must also be added that if you remember November, November 2014, uh, I think it was, it was the same situation whereby he too had to come out to say that he was not behind attempts to remove the former chairman of the party. So okay. the, you never the, can the, tell politics anything close. By your, okay, let's, let's uh, look at the editorial, which is also an interesting editorial piece this morning. And uh, it's taken from, uh, I think, National Economy. Uh, I, I didn't get the, uh, the name of this uh, paper. I hope. Economy. Yes, National, National Economy, Economy. I, I'm, I'm right. You know, and it, it's broadly captured, as you can see, fallacy of non-viable states. It says fallacy, fallacy of non-viable states. I, I, let me quickly, well, what he's saying is that um, they should begin to harness their assets to boost internally generated revenue and by extension boost the nation, national economy. And there are quite a number of states um, uh, that this paper says are not able to meet up it boils down to such a political crisis, insurgency, and all that. By yes, could I quickly draw attention to a story I'm sure will interest you? Uh, Justice Akoni Kweme, after acting as chief judge of Cross River State, has been refused confirmation, and another justice has been sworn in. This is basically because her state of birth is acquirable, but she was serving in Cross River. This is in spite of the fact that her husband is of Cross River State. The Cross River State House of Assembly declined to confirm her appointment and therefore Governor Yade had to look for another uh, acting judge. So Baya, what do you want me to say about that? Well, I'm, I'm, sure, it, it's, I'm sure it's of it, interest it, it, to you. It's been, it's been debated. Yes. It's been debated. In fact, there, Bayo, if I remember correctly, quick, there was... Yes, quickly say something about the, the editorial so that we can just... It's run. talking about many yeah. states are not viable and the editorial points out to a few states, Lagos, Ogun, Kano, Kwara and Rivers that are through their IGR uh, can be said to be viable. Many others will have to depend on federal allocation from the federation account to survive. And what he's saying, therefore, is that uh, these unviable states must look for in, a means of enhancing their internally generated revenue. The doors are now open with the diversification of the economy. There's hardly any state in this federation that doesn't have sufficient solid minerals that he can fall back on. Large mass for agriculture. So solid mineral agriculture that is the way but to go for diversification. Over, over the years, this has been debated. There's no, when you say that the state is not viable, yes, we agree to some extent. But then, what are the governors doing? Apart from uh, some constitutional uh, issues, you know, that may not allow them to tap into mineral resources in their states, there are other viable ways. Okay. Agriculture is there, you know, right, you who, know, which I can, can embark upon, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and sorry, the dependent, highly dependent of, of, uh, uh, of uh, governors on Monthly for that account is is, is the most laziness. You know, you know, you know. Account. This is an interesting topic we could look at, but but for now, Bayo and Kiran, I think we just have to you know leave the viable states at that <laughs> and then get on with the uh, conversation today. We're looking at, of course, the women and national development. We've got a full house, so we'll just take a short break and we'll. 
And you're watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Our conversation this morning borders on uh, women and national development. And to set the tone for our conversation, let's get this background report as put together by Victor Azu. <laughs> Women all over the world are making their marks in different spheres of life, business, education, the arts, sports and politics, to mention a few. When given the opportunities, women have given their male counterparts a run for their money. Nigerian women also do likewise, but clearly play second fiddle to their male counterparts. It is however in politics, which is widely regarded as a major vehicle for national development, that women have been in the shadows of men. For instance, in Nigerian politics, no woman has ever been elected governor of a state, let alone elected vice president or even president of a country. In the National Assembly, out of 109 senators, only eight are women. It is even worse in the House of Representatives, where there are only 13 women out of 360 members. This has led to many advocating gender equality, but the questions to ask are, what factors hinder women's role in national development? How can women become more relevant in the country's political terrain especially? Who better to provide answers than women themselves? And some of them are already seated in the studio to do just that. All right, Victor Azu, many thanks to you. And let's begin our conversation this morning on women and national development. Of course, as we said earlier on, this is against the um, International Women's Day, which is coming up on Sunday, I guess, on the 8th of March. So let me quickly introduce our guests here in the studio. Let me begin with the Honorable Minister of Women Affairs, Dame Pauline Talent, who's always obliging us whenever we call on her. Thank you very much, Honorable okay, Minister, yes, for joining okay. us. Okay. Uh, we also have with us another friend of ours, Distinguished Senator Hairat Guadabe, she's always here with us. She represented FCT from 1999 to 2003. Uh, I'd like to welcome you most respectfully. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. And uh, I have with us here in the studio, Comrade Afusa Tribu, who is also the National Chairperson, Trade Union, Women Congress of Nigeria. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. You look Good lovely morning, in, your, in your green and red. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Kieran. All right, ladies. Let uh, me see it to you. Uh, all, all right, ladies. Uh, <laughs> see with us in our Abuja studio is uh, Ebere Ifendo. Ebere Ifendo is, of a, women's, is a women's uh, right activist. Uh, Ebere, you're welcome to the program. Thank you. And again, we have uh, Deborah Akan. I hope I got that correctly. Uh, Deborah is an educationist. She's, of course, of the Hoop Waddle Training Institute, Calabar, Cross River State. It's a pleasure to have you here, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, from our Just Network Center, uh, we have uh, Bukwala Onishi, Country Director, Women for Women International. It's a pleasure also to have you this morning on our show. Good morning, Nigeria. Mm, just to add, uh, Kieran, that Ebere is also President Women in Politics Forum. Okay. Mm, get Go on. Ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Ladies, let's start the conversation. Uh, first of all, let's define the role of women in national development, really, uh, because that's the topic of our conversation. And let's begin with the Honorable Minister. When we talk about, um, you know, women in national development, what, what do we understand by that? How do we say it? Thank you very much. Um, the word women in national development can, the role of women in national development cannot be overemphasized. Even from creation, you know that when God created man, he saw that Adam could not function. And there is nothing that a man can do that a woman cannot really do, if not better. And women constitute over 50% of the population. If the woman is left out, then half of the population is forgotten. It means the country is disabled. It's like a scale where it's not balanced. 50, if 50, over 50% 50 of the population that are women are neglected, then the scale is hanging. The role of women 
in every sphere. Starting from creation, the mother is the first teacher. She teaches the child to speak, to do everything, nurture the child from, 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 from birth. She carries the child for nine months. I'm yet to see a man that can carry and incubate a human being for nine months. You don't know what women go through in pregnancy. Mm. Nurturing the child for nine months, that means that child communicates with her, only the mother, for nine months. The father has no role once the child gets in. It is the mother. Her breathing, the food she eats, everything she communicates with the child until she brings him into life. From birth, sleepless nights, at least for two years. Before the child goes to school, it is the mother that communicates. So the first teacher is the mother. And we all know the role of a teacher in nurturing and shaping that child right to adulthood. But the first teacher is the mother. And that's why if anything goes wrong, the teacher runs back to the mother. Because the home, socialization, home has a very critical role to play in the life of a child. And that is the mother. The mother is key. The mother teaches the child to speak, to behave, discipline, everything. So all our leaders today must pay tribute to mothers because they cannot be where they are without the proper upbringing and nurturing of a mother. If a woman can nurture a child from incubation up to adulthood, she shapes, she directs the child, everything. The home itself, the complete coordination of the home is the woman. As any man, if a mother travels and leaves him with the children for two, three years, one week, he is completely disorganized. Sh should we turn the question? Ask him. <laughs> he will confirm that. So, <laughs> you know, if a mother can do that, coordinating the home, bringing the child, preparing the child before school, the language the mother speaks to the child is the language the child speaks. The father has no much time. So, all these things are things that is divine, and God has given that special role to a woman. If she can do that, nurture, bringing him up, what else can she not do? All right, Honorable Minister, let's, let's pause you there. You've made a very that valid... That is just a tip. Yes, you have made okay. a valid point, in the, starting from the, from the family unit, which is very, very uh, pivotal, key, you know. Key. Yes, uh, you said that Adam couldn't function <laughs> effectively. Yes. Well, fine and good, he but what, not talk. what happened not after that is another, is another Until discussion. Until God created the woman. You know, what happened <laughs> after that is another discussion we may have <laughs> on another day. Right, because, uh, you see, we pay much attention to women, you know, because uh, God has made it so. That's agreeable. Uh, but now we're talking about national women in national development. Let's leave the family unit now. And I'm coming to you, uh, Senator uh, Kairat Guadabe. Um, with respect to uh, national development and women, uh, what's your take on what uh, have been the contribution of women, uh, not just up in the family unit, but uh, in other facets of national development? Well, it's First and foremost, we have to begin to understand and recognize women's involvement in national development. And to start with, like the Honorable Minister says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Without nurturing, you do not have the men that will come into national development to even hold the offices. For me, I feel over the years, you can divide national development into private sector as well as public sector. When you look at how does private sector um, impact on the global national development, you will now look at what are the indices, where are the women, who are the key players in injecting development at the private sector. When you look at the private sector, we start from um, petty trading, they call it. Anything women do, you have uh, more derogatory uh, excuse for lack of a better word language to use to explain it. Um, the women that buy and sell at 
at a lower income level. We, they're business women as far as I'm concerned. And their input to the gross domestic product of the nation is, is not properly recognized. Yet, they're the ones that constantly, they also pay their taxes, mind you. And they're the same women who farm, bring the farm produce to the markets, sell their farm produce, and may not even get the quality of value for what they have brought in. However, they're contributing directly to funds that go into national development. If you take it as notch higher, you have the women, you have the sector that is in charge of at the um, transport sections of the nation, people moving, um, people responsible for carriage of goods and persons. In that sector, the users of that sector are largely women because they are the ones that are heavily involved in moving their farm produce. And in that same sector, because the society feels that women, um, that sector is a risky business, they don't encourage women into the sector. But increasingly we're seeing women participating, driving all sorts of um, vehicles that run into women that are now driving uh, trucks mm. and so on. That's that sector. We've come across women that are aeroplane, I mean pilots, if you take it to the higher notch. Now, directly, the societal norms that have barred women from coming into direct participation that is visible into, um, is being broken down, and thankfully for that. Now, when you now take the private sector higher, you're now going into the sector where you're going to white color and blue color jobs. And in the white color and blue color jobs, you find women, but originally were secretaries and clerks and tea ladies. They're directly if in an office when you don't have before the age of computer. If you don't have a good secretary, you cannot function mm. because whatever the minutes are, whatever letters you want to write, you cannot. So women have consistently held that position. So much so that it's taking it a, a notch further. Some bosses find they end up marrying their secretaries because they now realize she's so efficient and dependable. They want to move her from that to, to run her, his home for him so he can advance more. Now that's direct direct women involvement at that level. Mm -hmm. Take it an, a further notch. In the boardrooms, increasingly now, chairmen of banks are women. Distinguished, let, let, let's put you on hold <laughs> and bring in Ebere Ifendo, who is the president of uh, Women in Politics Forum. And Ebere, I'd like you to you know, take us down memory lane and look at how much involve, involvement or how involved Nigerian women you know, have been since independence and tell us is there any aspect of national building or nation building where the women have shown some form of partisanship or be, been, been passive let me put it that way. Um, no i don't think so because um the independence struggle of this country we had our women in the forefront of it and even prior to independence we had uh, women in uh, i think in 1929 who stood up against the colonial masters. So you can see that uh, from the beginning, we have participated actively. And um, even up to this time now, we have even have young people that are participating from the university angle. So in every sphere of political life of our development, our women uh, never shied away from coming out to be part of governance and to be part of development of the nation. Uh, you introduced uh, the distinguished senator as uh, having represented uh, us from 1999, and that was um, the year we, you know, yes, uh, returned back to democracy. And uh, the honourable minister started her career as a councillor. She would have made it to be the first elected uh, female governor in Nigeria, and uh, today she is also a second-term minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So you can see our history. There are other women outside there that are not with us here. And so for me, I think we have done well against all odds. 
because um, the environment is not conducive because of a lot of uh, patriarchal issues, um, a lot of uh, mistrust. People see women as trying to come, you know, to take over, not understanding our rules that we need uh, to be part of governance, to have a balance. Um, we are talking about our economy today. We are talking about so many challenges coming up to security also. And I think the basic problem is not having more women in governance. Give a woman an opportunity. I tell you there will not be insurgency in Nigeria again. We have a natural way of doing things. Some of these people need to be cancelled. Some of these people just need to be reached out to. We are not doing that. It's not um, always that you use force you know, to get things done. So I think um, the basic problem we are having is not uh, the problem of, you know, it's, it's basically the problem of not getting women involved. If you, if you look at a democratic dispensation yes. from 1999 to now, I mean, we've come a long way. Within this framework, can you place the Nigerian woman, how much value has the Nigerian woman contributed to sustaining the democratic setup? Our participation alone is a huge, like I said yesterday at the program, I said this last 2019 elections, if we're going to use it to mirror, we had 2,970 women that came out to contest, not even in America have you had such huge number of women contesting elections. But that's just participation. It's not just participation. They contested as candidates. And before one could walk to that level of getting a, a ticket of a political party to run an election, it's something that you have to, like Oga Kerian said, we'll talk about in, uh, I mean, uh, subsequently. <laughs> okay. But the truth is that we have participated. We have made our mark. All right. Uh, you, I, I'm, I'm indeed uh, gladdened, you know, because uh, you are, people are talking from the positive point of view of the impact you have made, you know, uh, in, in, in the polity and in other aspects of our life. Uh, but again, uh, you know, women also complain a great deal in terms of uh, not being, not being, uh, you know, giving opportunities to uh, do one or two things. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, mm -hmm. let, but, but for now, let's uh, uh, Kira, bring in a. I'm a woman. Yeah, Don't I know. Forget. I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me get uh, Deborah Akan, who's uh, an educationist. Now, coming from the academia, uh, how, what is your assessment of uh, how women have fared over the years? You know in that sector and of course if you can of uh, you know uh, drift to some other areas but let's begin from the uh, from the academia okay i let me correct an impression i'm not just an educationist i'm a, an ordained minister of the water sacrament of the presbyterian church of nigeria and the national coordinator of the women's guild that's a women's group mm, i always know that the society, not just Nigerian society, but society as a whole is patriarchal. And for a woman to excel, she has to go the extra mile. And you find that in um, career, in politics, there are lots of challenges for women because the men would not like to give them a chance freely. And that's the truth. And so they have to go the extra mile. They have to work harder than their male counterparts, even in career. And there's this notion that if a woman excels in career, is not married, she has done some untoward things to get to the top. But that's not true. Women have actually done well, but we can do better. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I think personally, because women relinquished their roles as mothers. That's why we have a lot of societal ills today. But there's this awareness now, advocacy that we should go back to the drawing board. We should go back to our God-given roles to nurture the young ones. And nurturing starts from birth, not just when the child is grown and formed. And if we get back to that, you'll find that the society will be better for it. 
in the Nigerian society, for instance, there are so many societal ills which can be curbed if women are at the forefront. I always admire women that come out in, you know, to contest, that come into politics. I mean, the, from the religious sector, I may not contest, but I admire women who do and encourage them. For instance, my elder sister was a politician striving to um, get to the governorship position. And I always admire women who do that. There was a lady that came out to run for presidency in Nigeria, and there were there a lot of ridicule, even from women ourselves. And I think women need to reorientate their minds, because what you find is that even though we are more in terms of population, we find that we don't support our women folk. A woman comes out to constate, it's the women that will actually work against them. We need to get to that point. We are women, appreciate women. Otherwise, we cannot get to the presidency of Nigeria, and if we get to the presidency, I tell you, this country will be better for it. So in terms of the role of women in national development as of today, I think women have pushed themselves amidst all odds to get to positions of influence that they can actually impact. And we have a number of them, even though there are few, we have a number of them that are doing that, like the, my, my colleagues here that have spoken. I admire them when they are functioning at the Senate level and at the House of Reps, are functioning at the judiciary like the, so many like that. But I know that we can actually do better. Okay, let's 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 put you on hold, uh, uh, Madam Akin, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to you also. Uh, and we're happy that you represent the religious body here for us, because uh, a lot of uh, women also, you know, have uh, issues, you know, with uh, representation and um, opportunities in in that area. But let me bring in Comrade here. Comrade, just share, share with us your experience. The distinguished talked about, you know patriarchal system, you know, being broken down. Ebero also mentioned that there are certain things that need to give way. So are we really breaking down cultures in terms of, you know, giving women the chance, you know, to build? Um, thank you so much. Um, I think we're really doing that, but a lot needs to be done because as women, we occupy um, an indispensable first in nation building. And um, all of this cannot be achieved without empowering the women and the girl child. Mm. But what's your experience? You're, you're a comrade, so yeah. I expect that you would have, you know, been championing certain, you know, uh, courses for women. Yeah. Yes. Could just sh share with us what it is. What was the scenario like? Yeah, it's it's always very tough. The men are not always <laughs> wanting to to have us on board, but um, I tell you, it's a moving train, you know. We are all, we why, why, why is it that they don't want to have women on board? Yeah, because they don't believe in us and um, they think we are going to overpower them and then... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm. They always don't want to give us a chance. You, under, you understand? Mm. But um, I want to tell you that um, as a woman, um, we have really made a reasonable, um, we've achieved a reasonable percentage of sources and we're encouraging more women to come up. We need a voice, you know, we need a platform <coughs> where we can have more women, you know, on board. But the men are always not wanting to have us. They were always being relegated to the back seat, to the background. Mm. Business best yes, yes, but, that. but, but, but have we see, been able, Kirian? See, you, you can't say that we are relegated to the background <laughs> when you are a comrade who have, uh, you know, who, who you have reason, you know, to be the chairperson of Trade Union Women Congress of Nigeria. You know, it, 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 what I want to to hear from you, ladies, is not necessarily what men have been doing. You know, what about your own efforts? The efforts have put in. Um, Madam Deborah told us here that most of, or some of the time, anyway, women work against each other, right? And uh, we have seen in this country where when a woman ran for president in this country, and she was the only person that voted for herself. It was in the public glare. You know, it was covered live, right? So that's another part of it. <laughs> Before. We'll come I back see. to you. Um, let's, let, 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 let's go to Bukola. Sorry, we'll come back to you. Okay. Let's go to Bukola Onyishi in, 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 in Jos. Jos. And uh, Bukola, please, I, I want you to bring in international dimension to this conversation. Uh, basically, because uh, you represent uh, an, uh, an organization that has a, you know, uh, a international uh, footprint. Um, what's your own view uh, 
uh, about uh, women in development in Nigeria and elsewhere. I wanted to bring in this comparison uh, because we want to appreciate the level women uh, has gone in Nigeria and what happens elsewhere, you know, globally. What's your assessment? Interestingly, good morning, everybody. Interestingly, Women for Women International works in conflict affected countries, and uh, meaning that. Uh, we work with women that are affected by conflict, mostly. I will tell you that in the eight countries that Women for Women International works in, the situation of women are rather similar. The context may be different, the context of conflict may be different, but in terms of uh, the challenges that women face, very similar. But what we do, is to provide forums for empowering all the women that we are able to support in the program. And in support, I mean, um, in the context of Nigeria, for example, we, we work in the grassroots, in the rural communities. And you discover that perhaps just 30% of the women we work with have even primary school education. And remember, we are talking about rural communities. We need to look into what form of education do we have in the rural communities. When we say a woman has finished primary school education or a young girl finished primary school education in the rural communities, what does that look like in the real sense of it? And then we have a lot of situation around early girl-child marriage. And we are talking about women. The, the same uh, child that is married half early becomes the woman tomorrow. As a child, as a girl-child, a lot is missing. And then she steps into a totally new role, a role that she's not ready for, a role that um, is very challenging in itself, even for the women, or even for the adult women. But these are the realities that are in our communities. And then all the things that we have talked about this morning, how do we expect these women to step into this role? I look at some of them and I say, um, perhaps, if they were given the opportunity to be well educated, they would become anybody in life, successful people. Because with the little that we give them in terms of knowing your right, in terms of uh, learn about your health, decision making, form solidarity among yourself, give a voice to the situation around you, uh, look for solutions and uh, uh, challenge status quo. Whether we agree or not, it is a fact that in our society, the patriarchal system is very strong. And that is why even in our context, we also try to bring on the men. Because I also believe strongly that if men um, know better, then they would also want to take better decisions around uh, situations around women. If you look at it critically also, look at the uh, uh, population of Nigeria. It's been discussed. It's almost 50-50. If it is 50-50, then if 50% of the population is disenfranchised and it's just 50% that is trying to carry the nation, don't you think the 50% is also overworked and overstretched? And that in itself it's a problem because then you see the result, violence against women everywhere, every day, from the, the grassroots even to uh, uh, I, I mean, our helites. It's the same problem. So I, I believe that there's a whole lot that we need to do with um, a girl-child education, with situations around um, early marriages, with... Um, also educating the men, and then violence against women is something that we must work against. Oyinshi, uh, country director, thank you. We'll, we'll return to you. But ladies, Kiran said something about women and themselves. I'd like for us to look at this, bury it once and for all, so that it will not rear its head again. I'm sorry, uh, Kiran, I'm also a woman. So, so let's look at this issue. Have we been able to 
streamline, delineate what are the issues. Uh, women, their own issues, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. Um, we have issues everywhere. And I don't want us to uh, spend so much energy on talking about women being enemies of themselves. Men have enemies among themselves, but nobody talks about that. When a man is contesting, he has men fighting him too. So the issue of women having issues with themselves, we are addressing it very squarely. Yes, we know it's true. We are addressing it. But the role of a woman in national development is key. Tell me any field of life from market women who, who play very key roles, from motherhood. I said it with motherhood because no building can stand without a solid foundation. So we must still go back to the basis. But what specifically <coughs> are the issues? Apart from, you, you've said the issue of women themselves are being addressed. So we're moving, <coughs> yes. we we moving forward on that. Yes. We are. We are moving, moving that forward issue. on that. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have realized that and we're addressing it okay, very so. squarely. Okay, so. We need to know, love ourselves and address our issues by ourselves. I wish you watched our program yesterday part of the activities to celebrate the International Women's Day. From morning till late in the evening, we were on from one activity to the other. And <clears throat> we are not just coming out as women. You need a glass of water? <clears throat> even, you know, even the National um, United Nations has realized it. And we are not advocating the he for she. We have main champions who are supporting and speaking to support women issues. Women have been talking to themselves over the years and we are not making a headway. United Nations has realized it, we have realized it, and we are carrying the men along. The men who are our sons, our husbands, our brothers, know the important role we play. And there are certain men who know that without women, effective national development cannot be achieved. And we are beginning to see it at the state level, at the local government level. Let's take, for example, at the state level. And we are also encouraging them. At the state level, among all our governors, we have a champion, a key champion, and that's the governor of Kwara State. He has set an example that no state has ever. In the history of Nigeria, we've never had it. And because he believed in women, he knew the role women played for him to get into that office. So what's the example? The example is he's involving more women in governance. And watch and see the difference and the achievements the governor of Kwara State will make compared to all other states. The same with Lagos State, the same with Kaduna State, the same with uh, AKT State, the same. Other states are following, are keen in because they know that special role a woman can play. Okay, ma'am. The, the eyes, what a woman sees, what a woman sees, no man sees. <laughs> Our role is complementary. I want the men to get it right. Yes. We have this main champion who realize and know, and they are speaking out. Mm. Yesterday, we had main champion who spoke in favor of women. The girl child education is key and top on my mm. agenda. Yeah. Without addressing the girl child education, mm. we will just be going round. Right. Because an educated woman can be able to solve and sort out so many things. Okay. From the home to any level. Any level. Oh, okay, Honorable Minister. And that's why <laughs> Actually, I commend, you see, mm. at the traditional level, the Emmy of Kano mm. is already, he has set a pace. And I call on all our uh, traditional rulers to key in okay. because he is a champion of the girl child education. Oh, 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 all right, Matt. Thank you so much. You know, actually, why the issue of uh, women fighting each other uh, was, is, has always been highlighted is the fact that one already, already there's this complaint that uh, you are a disadvantaged gender. You know, when it comes to the, to the uh, things of life, you know, yet you have this fight. So it's going to be a kind of a double jeopardy, you know, for you. So that's why we are highlighted. So by the time you begin to help. Yourself. Then the men, we have this or nothing to you know to, to 
to do much just to give you an opportunity. That's what you did. You are looking for, gentlemen, uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, ladies, ladies. Uh, you know, I'm the only man here, so I I feel some wish. You know? Yes. Um, let's look at the conferences we've been having over over decades now. You know, we've had the uh, Women Conference of Copenhagen in 1980. We've had uh, that of uh, Kenya in uh, 1985. We have uh, Beijing 1995. I've also had uh, uh, another conference again on women. That's in, that's in Mexico in 1975. Well, some of these uh, conferences, you know, they are they're supposed to mark a turning point, you know, in policy uh, making and of course implementation of so many nations across the world. I want us to see how the outcomes of these conferences have been able to, you know, uh, yes, impact positively on uh, women, uh, particip participation in politics in, and other facets of a human life. I want to bring in uh, Senator, uh, Senator Kairat here, you know, who has already had a political experience and who I'm sure, you know, belongs to some organizations, you know, that are fighting for women's rights. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, the fact that women decided to have um, global meetings is a plus for the movement towards national awareness in respective countries that the women need to be involved in um, governance and moving the country forward. The plus because at the various, the key meeting, I think it's the Beijing conference, set the tone towards what nations should be doing. For me, when you go for national, when you have a national conference like that, and there's an agenda that comes out of it, you shouldn't take it hook, lie, and sinker. You bring it to your nation and adjust it to your own peculiarities and then move forward with it. Um, with the Beijing conference, if I will take it from there, that was the period we had, um, I think, Abach, um, Abacha, Mrs. Abacha, around, uh, if I'm not mistaken. After the Beijing, sorry, after the Beijing conference, they, she took a stand. This is military rule. And that's when they took a stand. Let me go back to IBB, uh, Mrs. Mariam. Um, Babangida, she took a stand as a, in our country to say, look, we must bring women forward to be part of um, governors. Take them out of where they are hiding or staying and bring them to the... Well, and she brought the theme, which is better life for rural women. And it took us far, far but not far enough with its... Um, it was like almost an affront on the cultural situations we had. And as such, it, we were faced with resistance in many sectors. Because how would you bring women to the national front? And many women didn't understand it. Some of them saw it as a period to be flamboyant rather than push issue and follow a certain direction. Then we saw the advent of um, Mrs. Mariam Babangida sorry, um, Abacha. Abacha, and she changed the tune and called it um, family support. Now, she now figured that we can bring women involvement and advancement within the family unit and move her with her family to advance. And through that process, we saw another step in getting women involved, and she kept pushing that women should be part of um, elections and women should virtually come out and contest. And that was personally the first time I said, okay, if they're serious, I will come out and contest. And that's when I threw in the towel during their period. I didn't win the elections there, but that was my first jump in because we got that encouragement to have women participate. Then after the, her period, we now didn't have first ladies that were pushing the issues. Now we had women themselves, individually in their respective sectors, like Honorable Minister in Plato, pushing to be part of the governance. And when the key to getting the confidence to be part of anything is really education, exposure. The disadvantage that women have, when we're growing, we're not taught to be team players. 
were raised as individuals. Now, men are taught to be team players, hence the masculine games, football, and things like that. So men group together to form things. And in that setting, you find that, you know, the skills of giving in to dissenting voice, fighting but not fighting to the end, and resolution, there are many skills that you acquire as being a team player, being in form of a team group. That's where the Honourable Minister was mentioning, if I got her correctly, that we're trying to get women more in more into team, uh, in to team becoming work. team players. So when you are become, you're used to teamwork, then you don't have this PhD syndrome, pull her down syndrome. And once we get that right, we will see the competition, the competitiveness. I must say, we could, women cannot, we couldn't get this far without the men. Okay. Mm -hmm. Honestly. I, 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 I'll, Thank you. Now that you've talked about getting far, Kiran has mentioned some conventions, but let me look at the, the um, multilateral framework. That's the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, which gave, you know, certain pillars, platforms, you know, of implementation. And basically, the, the responsibility falls squarely on lawmakers, you know, to integrate, you know, domesticate such laws, you know, so that women would have the power to begin to, not just to contribute to, you know, to, to nation building, but also, you know, to, 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 to have a voice, yes. to have a say. So, sorry, happen. sorry, distinguished. I just want to get, because you, you have been, at, at, at the law, at the National Assembly. I want to get the mentality of the lawmakers. There was a particular lawmaker, I think maybe it's seventh or eighth assembly, that stood up, you know, during one of the plenaries and said, if you give a woman 50%, if you give a woman so, so, so percent, Mr. Speaker, the woman, the women will rise up and take every position. Is that the mentality of the lawmakers we have? No, no, no. Don't forget people, the legislature come from different legislators come from different parts of the society and they come with their different cultural experiences to the assembly and that is why it's called an assembly where you will come with your ideas these are the issues debate it and in imputing your own experience and ideas he just brought his own experiences and fears which some he was brave enough to say because many men have those fears but they don't voice it now when one person voices it um, we now take exception to him but that's the underlying fear all women need to do is to alleviate that i mean make sure you reassure the men i i will share this with you when i first um came into the national assembly i ran as the deputy senate president and that was 1999. And if I can take you back to 1999, that's 20 years ago. We didn't even have toilets for women in the assembly. They were not expecting women to come. And here we are, women, three of us. So I, we ha I had to commandeer one of the male toilets for the women. But it was an affront to see a woman in this high office that is meant for the men. So then the biggest affront is she's running for the top position as well. You know, so you, you know, one push the bar, bar boundaries. And the reaction was, no, we're not ready to go with you. So I got votes, but not the majority to get the seat. But as the years went by and during interaction, their perception changed. Changed, yes. Because they now saw a different, that women can actually think this way, push this way, and be like men. So uh, uh, that's okay. how we were well, able to get there. a speaker. Uh, 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 distinguished. Let's say, uh, you know, pause it there. <laughs> if we have the time, we'll come back to you. I want to other people to also make uh, contributions. Uh, now to Ebere Ifendu, a women's uh, rights activist. This celebration revolves around Awareness Day, Women and Girls Day, Sexism Day, and Anti-Discrimination Day. Uh, can we now explore the theme of uh, this year's International uh, uh, Women's Day, uh, which is uh, each for equal? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirian. 
Um, but before I talk about this, I just want to say something about women not supporting women because it's something that um, keeps coming up every time. And uh, the truth is that it's only in politics that people say that. We have market women who support themselves. We have neighbor, neighborhood kind of uh, living, even at home, where a woman is rushing to the hospital, to the market or somewhere, and she leaves her child and with the August nest. meeting as well. August meeting also. So you have seen that it's only in politics. And this is happening because um, politics is a male-dominated, um, you know, kind of, I don't want to call it a profession, it's because it's really not a profession. Exactly. But the truth is that they have set the standard. And then they keep, you know, uh, putting out the rules. They have made women to think that naturally we are not supposed to be seen there. And so we need a lot of orientation. My big sister talked about a woman that contested for presidential elections and that she got only her ticket. That was a delegate's election. And then in politics, even as women, we want to play by the rules of politics. You have to reach out to delegates before you can convince them and get votes from them. And so a situation where you just come out because you're a woman, without you know, bringing out those issues that will make people to trust you, then it becomes a problem. Our distinguished senator said in 1999, getting to the Senate, the first thing she did was to contest for deputy senator uh, president. She got votes. You heard what she said. Mm -hmm. I got votes, but not enough to make it. Mm -hmm. So she was able to convince people who voted for her. And that's what politics is about. Mm. So um, not that we don't like ourselves, not okay, that we don't ahead. support ourselves. And then getting back uh, um, to your question, we said that this 25th anniversary of the Beijing uh, com, uh, conference that uh, we'll be handing over to the younger people, you know, dragging the, the younger ones to be part of what we are doing. We need different voices. So um, the equality thing we are talking about is actually to have more inclusion of the younger people, of persons living with disabilities, um, of men also supporting what we are doing. The minister talked about male champions yesterday who came out to support our cause. And this is because we have changed the dynamics. We have stopped the idea of you know, calling ourselves to a room to talk about what men are doing and what they are not doing. Now we have, you know, taking it a step further, getting the men involved, let them understand us from our own perspective and then bringing their own uh, ideas and mm. to support our cause. Mm. So you see that we are doing, you know, very well this time. And uh, it's a pity that um, the uh, conference, like usually we hold in uh, New York, will not be taking place this time. But I thank our Honorable Minister who says there's going to be a Nigerian version of it, okay. and that will give us an opportunity. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, but we want to fasten our conversation that the, the time is going. So, um, comrade, again, let's look at the theme. Kieran has raised that, uh, which we said is a each for equal. I just want to know exactly, because some time ago we were asking for equity. Now we are talking for equality. How does each for, you know, each, each for, for equal. each for equal, you know, translate to individual collectivism? I, I don't understand. Can you break that down for us? Let the men understand what we exactly we are asking. Okay, actually, each for equal is the campaign theme for today's internet for this year's International Women's Day. The theme is I'm Generation Equality, realizing women's rights. Equality is the key word. Yeah, gender equality. Mm. That is the key word. So what, what do we mean by that? Before yeah. we're talking about equity, yeah. we were saying, look, we are not asking for equality. Because, I mean, let's face it. Yeah. Let's face it. Yeah. Can, can, can we ever, you know, uh, uh, get that? Can we ever get uh, equal standing with the men? It's is possible. It, is it feasible? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. With time. It's possible. Explain. How is it possible? <laughs> okay. Now, it is possible because that is exactly what we are working toward. You understand? We're getting the government, everyone, to understand why there is need for us to fight for gender equality. And um, even though we are not getting the, 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 the response we should get from all quarter, but I tell you that it is possible. So is it equality in terms of, okay, in this, in this studio now, we have... 
three men, we have three women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have four men, we have, we have four women. Four women. We get paid for the same value of work. Yeah, we speak, we get the same, um, um, what's it called, um, voice with the men. And what have you? Okay, let's let's get to Bukola and Shikirian. You want to ask questions? Yes, I how, wanted how do we to, achieve that? I wanted to bring okay. in, uh, before we go to Bukola, okay. I want to bring in uh, <laughs> Madam uh, Deborah. Uh, you know, Madam, uh, you were talking about equality. Uh, our, our guests have said it is possible <laughs> to get that. But, you know, Western Europe currently, you know, has the highest gender parity globally, and it's about 76.7%, mm. right? These are, these, are, these, are, these are developed nations, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about equality in developing countries, of course, you have raised uh, some issues uh, that are, are actually um, <laughs> are not, not making it uh, really, really easy for, for you to get that. Some uh, encumbrances along the line of doing that, but of course, uh, we appreciate the efforts women are making, um, you know, currently. Uh, oh, Madam Deborah, <laughs> <laughs> going forward, <laughs> Going forward, uh, <laughs> what is there again for women to do in this climb, you know, to ensure that uh, they move ahead, if, at, the, at least they uh, will move to up to 70% of, of parity or gender parity in terms of appointments, in terms of education, in terms of opportunity, political or, 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 or otherwise? Thank you very much. There's something you said just now that... Um, always plays out when you have men with women being condescending. Mm. Oh, you guys are trying very hard. <laughs> they are doing very well. That's condescending. And um, that seems to cut across a patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. As I said before, when you look in terms of population, I don't have the statistics. But I think women are more than men. That's not been proven anywhere. Okay, good. And if you are more than men, and we are still struggling to get to leadership positions, then there's a problem. I agree. I was going through this International Women's Day on the uh, Internet, and what informed the United Nations giving us a particular day. And I read through all the conferences we've had, which Kirian has referred to. And I find that it is all an attempt to make women more assertive, more accepted as people that are made in the image of God. I'm talking from the religious perspective. We are all made by God. And then they say the theme is equal for what? Each, Each for, for equal. equal. Each for equal. Physiologically, huh. we cannot be the same as men. Oh. And I'm talking to us as a pastor. Physiologically, you can never become a man. Women are unique. We have the sixth sense, and that's why a man that doesn't listen to the woman has made a ma major mistake, a major blunder, because ultimately you find that the ideas, the advice the woman gave would have been the best. We are unique. And I want us to maintain that uniqueness instead of, say, equality. I, I agreed with the equity, that if you have three women here, you must have Three men here, that's equity. Good. So when you say we want to be equal with men, physiologically you cannot be equal with men. Women are vulnerable. That's why we talk about violence. Violence against women, violence against the girl child. Because but, but is it not a situation that makes them vulnerable? Yeah, it's physiologically, a society. they're not vulnerable. They're not created to, to be vulnerable. It's situation conditions it's, that it's, places it's, them in it that has condition. been the cultural prism that's men tend to look at women. If we get back to, you know, many years back, although this is changing in many, many societies, if you think back, there's a cultural prism that men look at women. That brings about the condescending aspect of, you know, when men are talking to you, it's okay, let's, uh, let's, let's give them a chance because they consider that it is their own right. At any point in time, they think it's their right. And so if they give a chance to a woman, yes. you know, let's help them. Okay, so, so Madam Akram, you don't believe in equality. For you, it should be equity. Is I, that what you're saying? Yes. Just, just yes or no? Yes. Okay. It so let be equity because we can never be equal to men because we are made differently. Mm. Okay. The, we are the, the, differently. Okay. Let's bring in Bukala Onyushi in Jos. Uh, Bukala, I'm sure you're listening into the conversation. 
And I just like for you um, to also share your view about the equality and equity thing, because I'm asking, what exactly are we asking for? Beijing said 35% affirmative. Now we are, I, I think um, we are taking it up higher to probably 50-50, equality, 50-50. But if you look at developed, developed societies, I mean, in the U.S. just just this morning, uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know, you know, dropped out of the of the of the race, presidential race, and and she complained of sexism. She complained of money politics. The same thing with uh, 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 from uh, Hillary Clinton. So, in the face of it all, is it is it feasible to have, you know, gender equality? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, gender equality has been um, an ongoing debate. And um, from the grassroots point of view, once again, I come. Let me share with you some stories that I've seen in the field, uh, uh, working with women at the grassroots, that maybe would buttress that point. So. A family that are farmers, they go farming, they till the ground, they plant, it's time for harvest, and then uh, from tilling the ground to um, harvest time, it involves the woman and the man. When it's time to sell off the produce, the woman is put to the background. She's denied that um, Regardless of her investments, even if she has brought in some uh, money into that, regardless of that, she's denied 100%, except for perhaps from time to time meals for the house. So what do we call that? For me, that in itself is um, a form of violence that should not be uh, encouraged. And for, for the man in question, it needs to be educated. Because if everybody, we are all human beings, male or female, we are all human beings. If everybody is treated right, and um, the, the, then um, we can all have a sane environment. We can all have a, a, an environment that makes each person um, appreciate, appreciate each other, each person um, also be willing and ready to support each other. So gender equality, gender e equity, uh, they are uh, terminologies, but in the real sense of it, in the practical sense of it, there are things that um, they should not be. If we treat each other and uh, right, and if we have that fundamental thing that each religion teaches love for each other. Thank you. All right, uh, ladies, uh, I, 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 I want to align myself with uh, what uh, Madam Deborah said, you know, when she noted emphatically that, look, we, we don't have to negate the biblical and Quranic injunction when it comes to the status of women from creation. It's not as if we're not interested in allowing women to get to a level where they'll be competing effectively and efficiently, you know, among men. But the thing is, you know, we have been given responsibilities by God in the first instance, right? And what, that's what does the, the Quran say about uh, the uh, women? No, uh, please, you, 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 you might go further into the <laughs> details. But, but I know <laughs> that uh, God placed women where they should be. And we must play our own role as men as well mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, we utilize women. They have capacity. They are, they are special creation. I agree with that totally. Right. But uh, for the purpose of this conversation, equality perhaps is not necessarily possible globally speaking. For now, let's take a short break. When we get back... All right, welcome back. If you've just joined in, this is Good Morning Nigeria, and we are having a very, very interesting conversation. Of course, it does when we are talking about women uh, issues. We've got quite a number of tweets, as you can see. They've come in torrents. And uh, let me quickly take uh, Chris Simeon. Uh, you say women are the mouthpiece of every society, true. Therefore, they should be given proper orientation, true. Quality education, thumbs up. They should also be allowed to contribute their own quota in nation building by giving them a chance to participate in policy and decision making that will stir up development and bring advancement in every sphere of our society. This Chris Simeon must be a, a he for she. Definitely. All right. Yeah, yeah, first of all, Sir Kimber, says, aside seeing women as mothers, which is great, I want to see women in boardrooms as chief executives and as presidents and state governors. 
All right, and Umar Musa Usman, women do contribute in the development of a nation. No doubt, but in a country like Nigeria, that virtually all the people are very, they are hardened. Women can only contribute their own quota, but I don't think they can, by themselves, make Nigeria to be, well, this is his opinion. <laughs> Matter about David Bullis, cultural affiliations are great threats. Another threat is women's lack of confidence in themselves. When Sarah Jibril contested for the post of president on the PDP, despite the large number of women delegates, she got only one vote, perhaps has. All right, Law Alpha, it's unfortunate that the system does not recognize women as being able to play beyond the second fiddle in the scheme of things in this climb. But the future will favor them as many are determined to impress. Comrade General, the role of women in nation building cannot be overemphasized. However, the uh, patriarchal nature of uh, the Nigerian society has caged them, but they yet are making waves in spite of this. And the Biodun Shegun and Falabe tweets, where does tradition place women? Do they believe in the ability to offer good governance and social justice? There is need to remind ourselves that, and he quotes, women build the man and the community, unquote. A noble society is a reflection of their women. Let's build and support our women. Titus Mondeyok, he says, uh, what happened to the Beijing Declaration as the platform for action that took place in 1995 where 189 countries, including Nigeria, were in attendance? Most of the affirmative actions have been thrown away by successive governments. Right, and Bedamasi Haruna Adamo tweet, since they nurture, conceive babies, if given the opportunity, they can also solve our problems politically, economically, and uh, uh, what have you. What's restricting them is lack of motivation, democratization of governance to accommodate them, and intimidation from the populace. Uh, Mike Ayako says uh, women's rules are no longer in the kitchen. Uh, Cure ED. We have a lot of women professionals in all fields of endeavor. In other climes, like in Europe, women have been given opportunities as prime ministers and uh, presidents of countries, and they carried out duties without utmost diligence, uh, with utmost diligence, dedication, and uh, patriotism. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, Chris Simeon again reminds us of Queen Elizabeth, Theresa May, and Eileen Johnson, Salif, all great women who have impacted and transformed their societies. But Bashiru tweets, some key factors that constitute a barrier to women's contribution to national development include some of the issues that we have raised, patriarchal nature of our society, motherhood, work-life balance, violent nature of Nigerian politics, sexism, money politics, lack of conscious policy, policies to encourage gender balance. Hmm. All right, uh, Delegate Solomon, the social, political, economic, and cultural systems have caused the Nigerian women to be isolated, to lack uh, initiative and uh, innovation. Uh, more proactive actions are therefore needed to ensure gender parity in education through special girl child education, scholarships, and effective implementation of policies and programs geared towards enhancing their welfare. All right, uh, Sunny Marco, the Marco G, uh, politics is dominated by men. Why, he says, because women do not have the heart to sponsor thuggery, violence, and all forms of manipulation to win elections. If we want our women to have a place in national development, we must de-emphasize politics of hooliganism and encourage gender mainstreaming. Yerima Alaji Hamza, Nigerian women subjected themselves to becoming second-class citizens. However, if government and society will encourage them, they will perhaps change their attitude for better. Mm. And Francis Obi again reminds us of uh, uh, women who have impacted our national development. He mentions some names, Queen Amina, Bransom Kote, and of course Ngozi Okonje, Weala Amina, Mohammed, and so many others that he has mentioned. Uh, comrade Ngala, comrade, you have it? Yeah, Comrade Ngala, no woman, no nation. They are the backbone of national development, but their participation in politics is very low. <laughs> and this, uh, this is an interesting one. Abdul Abdul too says, Kirian, in the mix of strong women, looking up and down, we need women to be the <laughs> All right, that's how I found myself this morning. You know, uh, Cecilia Okorama, I beg of you all that uh, even in the course of fighting for recognition of our rights in national development, let's not forget to invest our quality time in giving our children good home training. Very, very good point you've made. Mm. Uh, the rate of moral decadence in Nigeria of today is alarming. We must stand up to correct uh, the so much ills facing us as we struggle to be recognized in governance. I congratulate our lovely dogged mothers there. That's from a lady. Mm. Cecilia yeah. Okuruma, thank yeah. you. Mohammed Ibrahim again says, women, it's high time women stopped seeing men as source of their collective impediment. Uh, they should look inwards and take advantage of their numerical strength. 
Oh yes, uh, Amon says the father as a decision making figure in the household has to make himself available to the girl child because this will help build the mindset of that girl child. For instance, my father has nurtured me from uh, nine months up to now uh, without a mother figure. All right, and the last That's one is coming father. from, yes, uh, Gbola of Babs. And uh, we've seen women make considerable changes in administrative jurisprudence as well as political development. But that's not to say some of them have not been found wanting to, of course. However, a policymaker should do more to allow for women participation. Thank you, all of you, for your tweets. Let's quickly take closing comments. Please make it very brief and short. We'll start with the Honorable uh, Minister. So how do we go? What plans do we have to achieve the equality we're talking about? Thank you very much. There's a framework, and the framework is one, the girl-child education, which is key. The second thing, parents must treat the girl-child and the boy equally. The boy and the girl must be in school. Gone are the times that the girl will be kept at home to cook, clean the house, go to the stream, fetch water, and keep it. While the boys go to school, and when they come back, the girls serve I'm them. I'm sure you have, you have your framework to achieve that. That's right. Okay. So we have to ensure that parents treat their children equally, and both the boy and the girl must be in school. Education is the right of every child. Okay. It is compulsory. And then secondly, we must ensure that women must make sure that they give confidence to their husbands, and they... The way you treat your husband, particularly those in the office, goes a long way. Okay, ma'am. To, to get impact their support. On, to get their support. Okay. We, okay. Must, okay. we must clear the mindset of men because that fear, just like the single senator I read said, there's that fear. Women must make sure that we allay that those fears. Okay. Well, we are not guys, competing uh, with the men. Uh, uh, Our roles are complementary. If, if there is fear, <coughs> men like me do not have that fear, you know, because I, I, I believe in women and what they can do. Right. But I also uh, need them to understand that uh, a man is always a man. Uh, he's the head, yes. uh, however you look at it, okay? And uh, so for life to go on properly, that has to be respected. Um, uh, uh, Senator uh, Kairat, your closing remarks. Well, I agree that um, in the household, the men are the head of the house, they must be respected. Once you step out to be part of development of a nation, wherever you find yourself as a woman, you must respect the order of the place, bring in um, your positivity and not negativity. You must impact positively because a successful woman in position changes the minds of millions. Okay. Ebere, what is happening at the moment? What are your plans? Yeah, for me, I think uh, basically what we need most is legislation. So we need a national assembly to look at the gender and equal opportunities bill. We need uh, the electoral act to be amended. We also are asking for powers for INEC to be able to sanction political parties who do not live up to their responsibilities. I mean, especially uh, living up to their legal documents. We have affirmative action inscribed in all the constitutions, and then when they bring the list of candidates, we don't find women. So right. we are looking at legislation. For me, it's legislation. All right. Um, uh, uh, Madam Deborah, talk from the point of view of your religious background, uh, because uh, women these days, uh, when a man is a pastor or somebody is a pastor, women fall for it. Whatever he says, uh, they, they do. They go ahead doing that. And that has also disabled some families. Thank you, Kiran. But uh, that statement is not absolutely correct. It's not that when a man is a pastor, everybody falls for what he says. It's not correct. So what because there are many women that are distinguished pastors as well. But talking from my own perspective as a pastor, and in my women group, we are deliberate in grooming our women to make impact in the society. Raising them holistically, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and setting platforms for them to excel. The platforms include skill acquisition because we believe that if a woman is empowered financially, she can stand up in the society. Mm -hmm. The problem we have is that many women are subsistent farmers and they don't have the wherewithal to come out among the men folk to be assertive mm. because culturally okay. they are put down. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, comrade, so in the workplace, w what is happening? How are you taking up this challenge quickly? Yeah, the ratification of the ILO Convention 190 is going to go a long way in ensuring our participation. What does that seek? Elimination of violence, harassment in the world, work, world of work. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, uh, country director, uh, Women for Women International, Bukola Onyeji, who is in Jos. Uh, your closing thoughts on the conversation. Well, I would say that closing the gap between um, the national and the, and the grassroots is very important and um, should be invested in. Thank you. Of course, we have the Honourable Minister here. So, uh, Honourable Minister, against the International Women's Day, which is on Sunday, um, what are your messages or message to Nigerian women? My message to Nigerian women is that the struggle continues. We will not give up. And I can see light at the end of the ten tunnel. There's hope for Nigerian women. Because let's start from the national level. The president is getting it right. Although the number of women in the Federal Executive Council is insignificant, but watch and see. He has given key positions to the female ministers. He has confidence. He has given um, the Minister of Finance is a woman. And she's making this country proud. Zainab stands out and the president is confident that will go a long way to change his perception and get more women. The head of service is a woman. She was sworn in again after acting position for some months, just two days ago. That again will go a long way to change yeah, the perception. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Look at other positions. Minister of State, uh, Trade and Investment, Minister of State, um, Environment, Minister of State, Mr. Uh, Mr. FCT, and the Humanitarian and myself. These are key strategic positions that touches the lives of every Nigerian. He knows how strategic women are, and that's why. And the impact, the, our performance will go a long way to change the perception and give more opportunities for women. At the state level, I told you, the, some governors are getting it right, and they are already speaking. They are the he for she. The governor of Kwara stands out. The governor of Lagos stands out. The governor of uh, Kaduna stands the out. Of Enugu as well. The governor of Enugu. Name it. So many governors. Sokoto, Kano, uh, Plato. Name it. All these governors it's like a wildfire now. Oh, all right. Oh, oh, they are oh, seeing right, what, and because the strategic position and the performance of these women in various it's sectors it's a, it's a will now create it, it, more opportunities for women. It, 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 yeah. um, uh, uh, Martin uh, Luther had a dream, and the dream come true. comes true. That dream will surely come, come true. true. All right, Matt. because we are making progress. Thank you. And indeed. I thank the president. I thank all the governors and the chairman at local government. They are getting it right. More women, better Nigeria. All right, Matt. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, uh, Dame Pauline Tarling is a typical example of a woman that has uh, made it uh, to the top in this country. You have held several positions, and I want to appreciate you for that. And I believe that many more women, you know, will get into her shoes, you know. So at this point, we'd like to uh, appreciate all of you for your wonderful contributions. You know, you have all intimidated me here. <laughs> uh, but uh, let me just take it that way. Let me take it that way. Um, uh, Honorable Minister of Women Affairs of yes. Women and National Development, um, Women Affairs, yes, Dame Pauline Tallinn. Uh, thank you indeed, Minister of Women Affairs. Thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, Senator Kairat uh, Gwadabe uh, of uh, the FCT, well, Senator representing uh, FCT 1999 to 2003. It's been wonderful uh, sharing uh, your you know, uh, experience you know, this morning. Thank you indeed. And of course, a comrade there, uh, Afusal to Shwaibu, uh, Chairperson Union of uh, Women Congress of Nigeria. We appreciate you as well. Yeah, Claire. Yes, Abere Fendo, of course, President of Women in Politics. Thank you very much for joining us as always. And um, uh, Madam Deborah M.M. M. Akan, who is, of course, uh, Hope Waddell Training Institution in Calabar, Crossover State. And uh, you're also an educationist. Thank you very much, Matt, for finding time to join us uh, today. And uh, not forgetting, I almost forgot, I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> Bukola Onyishi, Country Director. Women for Women International Nigeria. Many thanks to you and do have a lovely day. I hope Joss is cool. <laughs>
All right, thank you, everyone. That's Good Morning Nigeria for today. And Kiran, I'd just like to thank uh, the CP, that's the Commissioner of Police, uh, FCT. Yesterday night I had uh, an incident and he responded uh, you know, swiftly. That's the, the road along Yanya Karo axis. But I'd like to appreciate him and also ask him to deploy more policemen on that yes. axis. There are mm. bad boys bad boss yeah, springing on, mm. on that axis. Just as you, as you uh, proceed beyond the Mogadishu Barak, and entering to the military checkpoint. It's, it's becoming a very dangerous route for uh, travelers. All right, see you next week, all of you. By God's grace, I am Claire Dilabwa. And I'm Kiran Umayo. Have a great weekend.